Hi everyone, welcome to the course of structural biology. I am Dr. Shogato Hajra from Department of Biotechnology IIT Roorkee and I am your guide to take through this course. My idea to develop a structural biology course is to first make it very introductory so that I could explain what is happening as a whole around structural biology not only about structural biology techniques. What I am trying to is to give you a comprehensive idea in this journey starting from how biology is developed, a kind of historical tour of how biotechnology is developing, how the biotechnology research start recorded and further going through the biological macromolecules, how they have to be read out, how that reading would be utilized towards developing structures, the structural biology techniques and then how to read the 3D coordinates, how to use them towards visualization, how to look at this process, the static structures which we are solving towards dynamics and then some applicative measures where you could see that how we use structural biotechnology or structural biology techniques towards development of science, towards applications. Obviously, the starting question everyone have in their mind is why we should learn structural biology. And the one line answer definitely is seeing is believing. So, through the structural biology, we could see the molecules and as Kenneth Turnbull told, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, we want to make visualization, we want to make pictures so that and especially pictures in high resolution so that you could visualize what is happening in biology. But if that would be the only goal of this course or the subject structural biology as a whole then it should be concentrated on understanding structural biology techniques, which I say the method of structure prediction. But structural biology is much more than that and it would be my humble effort to go through to cover the holistic picture to develop which will give you an idea of what structural biology as a whole means, what it is doing. Structural biology is the study of how biological macromolecules are built. Using a variety of imaging and spectroscopic techniques, scientists view molecules in three dimensions to see different functions. One, how the architecture is. If you look at this is a protein, I will discuss it in the protein structure. These have beta barrel structure. And if you look at this, you see that this molecule is green fluorescence protein which have revolutionized the world of microscopy. So, when you look at the structure, if you look it carefully, you will see that there is something inside which is called a fluorophore or chromophore. Because of the generation of that chromophore, green fluorescence protein is giving us this green fluorescence which is utilized in fluorescence spectroscopy. How and how the mechanism is going, we would discuss in detail in the next part of our lectures. How macromolecules interact? Interaction of macromolecules that means how it communicate is one of the most critical thing in biology. If you see here, there are different DNA protein interaction there are different transcription factors which are having different motifs. We will talk about motifs. So, using those motifs, they interact with DNA in different way, creating different signals. How the membranes are built up? We know that the organelles in the cells are divided by membrane and membranes are having a critical role for making in and out for many molecules. So, how the membranes are 
constructed of how it make differentiation and all these things would be part of structural biology. How the protein synthesis machinery looks like? As we know and we will go through, protein is the most important molecule to provide function. So, how that protein synthesis is happened by taking protein? This is the structure of ribosome uh, as a cartoon, but when we go and look at the real three dimensional structure, we understand more than that and that is one of our goal. How protein interact with solvents? As we know in the physiological system proteins interact with water, protein interact with ions and all. So, their interaction takes very important role that also we are going to look at. How protein adopt alternative conformations? As we say in if you think about a cell or a biological system, you will see that it works like a factory. The only difference is there is no operator standing there to make it switch on and off. This type of conformational changes what you see in the protein here helps in switching on and off and making biological process going smoothly. As we all say in biology, especially for enzymes, enzyme work is good like you work is good. Enzyme not work is not bad unlike you, but enzyme overwork is always bad. It could create a lot of diseases if enzyme could not switch on and off in proper time. All those informations has helped researcher understand how the thousand of different molecules in each of our cells work together to keep us healthy. Structural studies have also shown how mishappen molecule make us sick and as a result these studies have prompted new treatments for many disease. We start from sequence, we go to structure and structure give us function. Like here you see we have a sequence, we come to the structure here and by getting structure we understand how it bind to the ligand substrate. So, the first and foremost application of structural biology is to utilize the sequences and help us getting the function, but that is not the end. Structure help us in many things like evolution. If you look at the changes of domain structures, organization, conformations, they help us looking or tracking the evolution happening in this world. So, we started talking that seeing is believing, but there is something more than that. As Brandon Stanton told, the eye does not see, the brain sees, the eye just transmits. So, what we see is not only determined by what comes through the eyes, what we see is affected by our memories, our feelings and by what we have seen before. So, yes structural biology could be your eye, but by taking carefully it could be your brain. So, let us start a journey where not only our goal is to learn the protocols of structural biology techniques, but to understand how biology is developed and how structural biology techniques, how structural biology approach have taken roles in making the journey of biology successful. To start with the observation, I will go the first thing I talked seeing is believing and this might not seems to you that it is connected to structural biology, but personally 
I think that journey of biology, understanding it is very intricate part of understanding the entire thing. So, biology as we all know is the study of living organisms and their vital processes. It began as natural history which aimed to understand the whole organism in context. Natural history which is essentially the study of plants and animals was based on observational method, how people have observed the behavior of plant and animal. A lot of drugs were evolved, a lot of technologies came through that. It can be found from the earliest recorded history of biology that the Babylonians, the Egyptians, Chinese and Indians made innumerable observation in the course of their agricultural and medical practices. And here I have given some of the epics, you know, which would show us how the observations are recorded, how the scientific findings are recorded. Observation through eyes or by merit. People have learned a lot in this era about life, but they are unable to learn things which would lead to any rational concept or hypothesis. I am talking about Egyptians, Babylonians, Chinese and Indians. And there are many of my fellow Indians who could argue with, uh, you should know about that we have invented a lot of modernized instrumentations communication tools, uh, weapons and all. So, why you are thinking? It is not what I am thinking, it is not what I am arguing. What I am saying is about recorded history. If you look at recorded history, the first invention or the first proof of creative mind come from Greek civilization rapid progress started to made the, with the advent of Greek civilization. Greek civilization produced legendary personalities who by virtue of their astounding insight examined the phenomena of the natural world and made seminal contribution to natural philosophy. The most distinguished of them was Aristotle whose interest span on all branches of knowledge including biology. So, this is Aristotle. He was first to undertake a systemic classification of animals based on specific principles, some of which are even valid today. So, what Aristotle did? He had made classification of animals. What Aristotle did for animals? Theophrastus, his student, did that for plants. So, if you can say Aristotle is the father of zoology, Theophrastus is the father of Botany in that way. This is Theophrastus. Greek scientists were not even confined themselves only in the classification and categorization of animal and plants. They speculated about the nature of matter and formulated hypothesis. So, Democritus, another legendary scientist, proposed that all matter consisted of tiny particles which were further indivisible. So, if you look at with your modern eye, he, you could understand that he already reached to the concept of atom, but not more than that. Because if you read those hypotheses, you will see that they have visualized atoms as a solid thing. So, they did not reach beyond or after atom, but they reach up to atom, the concept. This is Democritus. The early atomists thought that the infinite universe consisted of atomos or atoms and void spaces. Early Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus held the view that the universe contained a creative force which he called physis. Physis is the originator term of physics in modern science. Thales thought that the basic element of matter was water. This is Thales. Anaximenes believed that it was not water, it was air. This is Anaximenes. 
Heraclitus mentioned that it was fire. Empedocles combined the idea of water, air and fire and include his own which is earth. So, this is Empedocles and this is the concept of water, air, fire and earth that are the four elements they used to think. Accordingly, the notion emerged that all matter was made up differing amount of fire, air, water and earth held together by forces of attraction and repulsion. Physis as the creative force was accepted also by Hippocrates, the eminent Greek physician, but the member of Hippocratic school they do not give importance to roles of fire, air, water and earth, their roles, but they believed that the living bodies are made up of four humors, which means liquid or fluid, blood, felgum, choler, which is yellow bile and melancholy, which is black bile. And somehow, they are they made connection between the humor and the elements, blood with sanguine which is socially useful is connected to air, yellow bile which is for ruling is connected to fire, felgum which is getting is connected to water, black bile which is avoiding is connected to earth. So, they did a lot of initial observations, made hypotheses and some of them as I told already are still valid. But it was not possible for them to verify all such speculation and hypothesis through experiments. The civilization had no dearth of creative minds as we have seen already, but lacked proper tools to conduct scientific investigations. The world had to wait hundreds of years before the microscope revealed the basic structure of both plants and animals. So, let us see how from the initial creative minds are more effective with proper tools to come and how they help biology to proceed further. So, let us come to the history of instrument for visualization. The magnifying power of segment of a glass sphere was known for nearly 2000 years. During the first century AD glass was invented by the Romans. End of 16th century, two Dutch spectacle makers, Hans Jensen and his son Jacarius, invented the compound microscope by putting several lenses in a tube. So, before it was like glass and glass converted to a lens, but now they have developed combination of lenses. However, their instrument were of little practical utility since the magnification was only around 9x and the images were blurred. So, this is Hans Jensen and Jacarius and this is the microscope they have invented. The real breakthrough came through in 17th century when another Dutchman Antony van Leeuwenhoek became the first man to make and use of a real microscope using single lenses magnification up to 270x. This is Antony von Leeuwenhoek. So, now when it came into that stage, the improvement of microscopy, it facilitated the introduction of a new concept in the internal structure of living organisms which is called the cell. The credit of first description of the cell goes to Robert Hooke, an English physicist and microscopist. Hooke found air filled compartment and introduced the term cell, which was published in 1665 in Micrographia. So, this is what you know he could see under the microscope. In the meantime, microscopy continued to undergo technical improvement. Chromatic aberration was something which creates problem with earlier microscope and that result in the compromise of the resolution or resolving power. The problem was satisfactorily addressed by the introduction of achromatic microscopes. So, this is the chromatic aberration and when it was taken you will see that the 
resolution of the picture significantly improved. In 1838, German botanist Matthias Jacob Selden postulated that every structural element of plants is composed of cells or their products. This is Selden. Subsequently, in the following year, German zoologist Theodor Swann extended the proposition to include animals. Biological science saw a reapproachment between botany and zoology, which they have seen when Aristotle first come up and with his student, he had given the classification and categorization. So, this is Theodore Swan. The conclusion of Sladen and Swan together formed the cell theory, a gigantic advance in the study of living organisms. Added to this in the 1850s was Rudolf Virchow's aphorism omnis cellula a cellula, every cell from a pre existing cell. This is Rudolf Virchow. So, in cell theory, they have made some postulates all living organisms are made of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. Cells arise from pre-existing cells. Hereditary information is passed from cells. All cells have the basic chemical composition. Energy flow occurs within the cell. So, these are the main hypothesis of cell theory. Now, when cells preliminary work was established, the attention of the scientific world shifted to the living process inside the cell. Together with the cell theory, two other landmark developments during the second half of the 19th century make the study of intracellular component all the more compelling. These developments are associated with two legendary individuals, Charles Darwin and Gregor Mandel. Theory of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. In 1858, Charles Darwin published his Theory of Natural Selection on the origin of species by means of natural selection. The crux of the theory was as follows. In the randomly varying nature, some variations are more advantageous than others. There is always a struggle of existence and those organisms which are better adjusted to their environment even slightly will most likely survive and transmit their advantageous traits to the next generation. So, according to his own language, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. This is called adaptation and if you ask me the example of adaptation in modern time, I could see you a very good example. I could see if you remember all this picture, this is saying about the three monkeys of Gandhiji, where they are saying they would not look at anything bad, not listen to anything bad or not say anything bad. Current evolution is the fourth one who will not do any of these things because he or she is so engrossed in smartphone. That is the current scenario of adaptation. Coming to laws of heredity, Gregor Mandel, the father of genetics, carried out extensive fertilization experiment with garden peas and formulated a set of laws known as laws of heredity. The first principle, the law of segregation states that the hereditary units are paired in the parent and segregate during the formation of gametes. So, they are pair, suppose they are T, they are TT and when it cross, they come T from here and T from here. So, this is called the law of segregation. The law of independent assortment states that each pair of units is inherited independently of all other pairs. There is no relation in that way. It is independent. And the third one, the most important, the law of dominance maintains that the trait units act as pairs in the case of 
A pair with contrasting traits the dominant one appear in the hybrid offspring although the recessive one is also present. Like if you see here there is a trait big T and there is a small t which is this is the big t is tall and the small t is short. So, they give t t all these are tall. So, the dominant species is working here. Ironically, Mendel's findings were not recognized during his lifetime. He had done very notable work, but nobody understand that at that time. It was only at the turn of the century that his work was rediscovered and as part of activities in relation to the laws of heredity ensured thereafter. In 1909, Danish botanist Wilhelm Johansen coined the term gene as a physical and functional unit of heredity. Earlier in 1905, British geneticist William Bateson had introduced the term genetics. So, now when we know about genes and genetics, the question is where in the cell the genes are located? And the answer was already there. So, the cell nucleus and the chromosomic content were already known by the time gene and genetics were invented and properly named. Between 1825 and 1838, the nucleus was reported by three investigators, including Robert Bowne, who is credited for coining the term nucleus. Subsequently, German anatomist Walther Fleming, who is said to be the founder of science of cytogenetics, was the first to observe and systematically describe the movement of chromosomes in the cell nucleus during normal cell division. In 1915, American geneticist Thomas Morgan and his students asserted that genes are the fundamental units of heredity. Their research confirmed that specific genes are found on specific chromosomes and that genes are indeed physical objects. So, this is Thomas Morgan. So, through that we have proceeded the chromosome theory of inheritance emerged now. And when they were focused on genes, the protein was not even neglected. Major advances were already made in the investigation of another kind of important physical object of the cell, the proteins. In 1789, French chemist Antoine Fourcroy had recognized several distinct varieties of protein, though the term was not used then from animal sources. They have purified or studied albumin, fibrin, gelatin and gluten. Several years later in 1837, Dutch chemist Gerardus Johannes Mulder determined the elemental composition of many of these protein molecules. The term protein was subsequently used by Mulder's associate Jacob Bergelius to describe this molecule. So, he have given the name protein. The name was derived from the Greek word which means primary in the lead or standing in front. One class of protein which are enzymes catalyze the biological process in living organisms. The first enzyme to be discovered was diastase, which is now known as amylase and still a very industrially relevant protein. This is the structure which solved later. It was extracted from malt solution at a French sugar factory by Anselm Pine in 1833. The term enzyme was coined in 1878 by German physiologist Wilhelm Kuhn. In 1897, Eduard Buchner, a German chemist and zymologist, fermented sugar with yeast extracts in the absence of live organisms. These also 
have shows that the enzyme could work without the presence of living organism. So another breakthrough innovation at the same time. Nucleic acid was discovered by Swiss physician Frederick Mischer. Frederick was working in the laboratory of Felix Hopser, a very famous laboratory of that time at Tobingen. Mischer initially intended to study proteins in leukocyte that is a blood cell containing nuclei. This is Felix. However, in Frederick's experiment, he noticed a precipitate of an unknown substance and that time established test shows that this is neither a protein nor a lipid. Unlike protein, it contained a large amount of phosphorus since the substance they got from the nucleus, they name it as nuclein. Later, Albrecht Kossel, who is working with Frederick Misser at the same lab of Felix Hopser, found the nuclein consists of four bases and sugar molecule. Kossel provided the present chemical name nucleic acid. In 1909, a Russian-born American scientist, Phoebus Levine, isolated nucleotides, the basic building block of ribonucleic acid. DNA as a genetic material, all these advances actually not making impact till the late 1920s, the question regarding the nature of genetic material remained unanswered. The scenario started changing in 1928 when British bacteriologist Fred Griffith carried out an experiment on the pathogenicity of the streptococcus pneumonia. Though not conclusive, the experiment did lay the foundation of later discovery that DNA is the genetic material. This is Fred Griffith. The results showed that Apparently, something in the cell debris of a virulent strain of streptococcus had transformed an abvirulent strain to become virulent. This something was called the transforming principle that time. It remained unclear what the transforming principle was RNA, DNA, protein, lipid or carbohydrates, the biological macromolecules. So, what they did, this is the description of the experiment. They may they choose a rough strain which is non virulent and inject it in the mice. Then it then they take a smooth strain of streptococcus which is virulent and when inject it to mouse, mouse dies. Then they use heat killed smooth strength, the mouse is now not killed, but when they mix up that smooth strain, hit killed smooth strain with the rough strain, they see that that combination make the mouse effectively killed. So, then they understand that there is something in this virulent or non-virulent strain which help the mouse to kill because the non-virulent strain normally could not kill it, but when in combination with it killed strain, it could be able to kill. Avery McLeod McCarty experiment of DNA as a genetic material. The conclusive evidence was provided 16 years later in 1944 by American microbiologist Oswald Avery Colin McLeod and Macklin McCarty. These are the three people. They established that the active genetic principle was DNA since its transforming activity could be destroyed by deoxyribonuclease, an enzyme that specifically degrades DNA. So, what they did, they take the rough non-virulent and heat killed smooth virulent, which already had taken in the earlier experiment by Fred Griffith. What they did, they combine them, they add protease to one and DNS to another one. 
when they add protease the mouse dies means they could not kill the killability or killing power of the mixture whereas when they add dnas the mouse is now survived that means dnas make the factor involved in killing ineffective that's why there the chance of that being dna another very significant experiment is called hersey chase experiment a confirmation of the conclusion made by avery and his colleagues came in 1952 from two scientists alfred hersey and martha chase who were working at cold spring herbal laboratory this is hersey and martha chase the protein coat and dna core of the bacteriophage bacteriophage is a organism which is a virus they generally kill bacteria it was used to label with s35 and 32p respectively so radioactive sulfur and radioactive phosphorus by infecting a bacterial culture with the radio labeled fudge they showed that the parental dna and not the parental protein was present in the progeny phage so they make this experiment sulfur label protein is colored as red they go in the cell and after centrifugation no sulfur goes inside the cell so it is not the proteins which are responsible whereas when they label the dna which is labeled as green they make the infection and isolate they found the radio labeled dna which proves that it is confirmed now that the factor is dna and not protein undoubtedly with the discovery of the two most important macromolecule of the living cell dna that carries the blueprint of life and protein that executes the plan biology had turned molecular in fact in 1938 warren weaver who was the director of the natural science section of the rockefeller foundation at that time introduced the term molecular biology the cellular processes were now required to be explained in terms of molecular interactions they want to go deeper than the behavior of a dna or a protein they want to go for individualistic characterization it became even more evident that the living system conform to the laws of physics and chemistry so there is a scenario created before people have done separate things but now a interdisciplinary platform is going to be developed eminent geneticist harman mueller recognized the similarity between the contemporary development in physics and genetics in 1936 he even made a fervent appeal to the physicists and chemists to join forces with him and his colleagues in unraveling the fundamental properties of genes and their actions 8 years later a, in a book entitled what is life erwin schrodinger and when i say schrodinger many of you think schrodinger is someone who develops software no there is a software the company called schrodinger erwin schrodinger is one of the founder of quantum mechanics made a similar plea and express his thoughts many of which were similar to those of mueller so that was talking about that we need such mergers and like to be, before coming into that let's make a summary of what we learn we start learning about ages where people make observations but could not be able to develop record towards scientific proceeding then started greek civilization 
where they did categorization of animals, categorization of plants, bring the concept of atoms, develop the forces which held together a earth, fire, air and water. This theory was accepted by some people, some people talk about four humors which are liquids of life. Those are wonderful contribution, but not proved significantly without having the instruments. It starts with the development of glass, which gives rise to first compound microscope, which is called Jacarius microscope, which have around 9x resolution resolving power, whereas from there Leeuwenhoek make it 270x, a real improvement which goes to the theory of cell. People start working on cell, giving cell based theory, which talks about this is the basic unit. This could generate from one cell to pre existing cell and other molecules like DNA, protein, lipid, carbohydrate, they stay inside the cell. Also DNA is marked as the genetic material. On the side by side, there is a huge improvement from 9x to 270x to better microscopes. where chromatic aberration gives rise to even better resolution. So, we see two possibilities, one we will look in the next class how the microscope improvement is going further, one second we have seen the possibility of merging of natural science and basic science. So, we will see how the marriage would be establishing in future in the next class, not probably in the immediate one, but in the next. So, I invite all of you to the probable marriage scenario of biology and basic science. With that, I will finish today. Thank you very much.